love to answer any questions that you have. So, today, the fig tree. Actually, today is a conclusion of, yes, of last Sunday's sermon. Now, last Sunday, many people got upset with me because I disrupted your service. You know, anybody, anybody know what was last Sunday anyway? It was, the sermon was spiritual warfare, but what was going on that Sunday? It was the persecuted prayers for the persecuted saints in the world. And I thought about how I was going to bring that to this church. And I listened to many prayers, and we had prayed, and I had prayed many places about the persecuted church. But you know what? We don't know what it is to be persecuted. And we don't know what it is to feel like when we're getting attacked. And so I want to bring a little bit about it last Sunday. And most people say, well, you should have told me. Well, if I'd have told you, it wouldn't have been a surprise. You know, uh, I'm thinking about how these battles occurred. How many of you heard of the Battle of the Bulge? In 1944, the Americans were there. They thought they had won the war. They were sloshing. They were just laying around. They thought the war was going to be over by Christmas. And the Germans attacked. They didn't think the Germans had the place to go. Well, I guess the Germans should have told the Americans before they attacked. I mean, come on. Of course they're not. The enemy's not going to tell you what they're going to do. If you know it's going to happen, you can get ready for it. That's what the Bible's trying to tell us, that spiritual warfare is going to happen. And so we got people all upset. All we did was mess up your service. What do you think the devil's going to do? What do you think the devil is going to do to your Christian walk? Oh, let me put on my gloves on and talk to you very nicely. He's going to hit you where you don't expect it. He's going to hit you where you don't want it. With me, my wife, he's hitting us with our children. We thought our children were gone. I mean, we thought they were taken care of, graduated, they got good jobs. And all of a sudden, bam, the whole world collapses on us. Because we laid back. We quit praying feverly for our children like we were. Why? Well, they're good. They're, they're good to go. So we backed off, and the devil slammed us. Last Sunday, all I did was mess up your service. I didn't preach nothing that was unbiblical. I didn't do anything unbiblical. I just messed up your order. And people blew a fuse. What are you going to do when the Antichrist comes? The persecuted church. In the latest report, three and four martyrs right now is in Africa. Every day from, the, from, 20, from last year, every day, 13 Christians worldwide have been killed for their faith. Twelve churches every day are being attacked and burned. Every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested and put in prisons. And there are another five every day are abducted. If you think this is bad, you ought to see the things that's happening in the world. What's happening? What? Why? Well, one, the increase came, they know, because of COVID-19. They used that as an excuse to attack the churches. What did they do? They closed churches down. And those that said no were persecuted. They sent armed guards in Africa against the churches that were praying and arrested them. And some of them never showed back up. The devil is attacking the church. And that's spiritual warfare. And if the church doesn't grow up and doesn't get off milk and start getting on some meat, you're going to find yourself without nothing to do. And people say, oh, that's, that's a long ways away. You sure? In India, 100,000 Christians received aid from Christian workers because they had lost their jobs in the last year because they were Christians. India 
is moving up their persecution. And so what is the church doing? We're falling asleep. We get upset if you mess up the service. You mess up the song or you mess up the communion. Well, that's not appropriate to have a happy birthday in the middle of, of communion. No, it isn't. But do you think the devil's going to follow your traditions? You know what? I'll attack you when you're later because right now is just not the right time. Church and across America need to wake up. They need to understand that we are a target. And let me tell you why we're the target, and that's the sermon today. The fig tree. If you open up your Bibles to Mark 11, it's on page 1562 of your pew Bible. And this is Jesus talking, and this is Jesus just coming in, just right after he came in, his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. This is when he came in on Palm Sunday. He showed up. He had, Hosanna, Hosanna, blesses the king. They're just worshiping him. And he shows up. And look what happens. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now the next day, when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing afar off a fig tree having leaves, he went to see perhaps he would find something to eat or, or something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. Pay attention. Nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for the figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from this ever again. Now, there's a lot of message right there. And the fig tree is the representation of the church. Back then, it was representation of Israel. It was looking good, but on the inside, it had nothing. It had no fruit. It had no purpose. Now, key here, remember, Jesus was hungry. Now, we know that Jesus could make what? Remember, he, just, he fed 5,000 earlier. He fed 4,000 earlier. He had picked... The fish could all, remember that he picked up all the fish? I mean, he could get food. So what was he hungry for? What did he see in the fig tree that he was hungry for? It, obviously, it wasn't food. It was souls. He is hungry for souls. When he sees this beautiful church and he goes in there, is there any fruit in that church? Or are we just sitting there, a bunch of programs, and about order, and about uh, something to feel good? What did Jesus look for? The other thing was, it was not even the season for figs. Was it the tree's fault? All you farmers there, okay? I want you to go out right now, Monday, I want you to plant your corn. Would that make sense? Why? It's not the season for it. But here it says he knew it wasn't the season, but yet he still wanted to see the fruit. And Jesus said, what? Be prepared in season and out of season. And so last Sunday, it shouldn't have upset nobody. You should have been ready for any attack that the enemy is going to do. The key should have been when you looked at your bulletin. Problems are coming. But no. And the second thing, I wanted to do something that Sunday, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea how I was going to do it. I even picked up the psalm book and said, well, maybe we'll just get up there and start singing a, song, a, a hymn. Maybe I just get up there and start singing. That would definitely do it. Okay? And so I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And yes, I waited to the moment that I saw an emotional move of the church in the middle of a song. 
You think the devil's going to do it when you're ready? No, the devil's going to attack you when you're not ready. The fig tree teaches us many things. If we, what we just read, leaves alone is not enough. To have a building, to have a church, and say that you're a Christian is not enough. You may have the trappings of good things. Jesus said, what did he say to the Pharisees? You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're filthy. You're dirty. Clean the inside first before you clean the outside. Leaves. Make it look good. Tina planted two pear trees. They have leaves, and they're growing. We ain't ate one pear from that in how many years now? Four years. Oh, got one this year. So what should we do? If I was Jesus, I would do what? I'd have cursed that pear tree. It don't matter. Jesus knew the fig tree was not the time. But yet he cursed the fig tree. Because the fig tree obviously should have known. If it's a reference to the church or reference to Israel, we should know. We should know that we're to be ready in season and out of season. You come to church not for a program. You come to church to meet Jesus Christ. And when he shows up, is there fruit? Or are you just nothing more than dressed up for a party? Is this nothing more than a club and you get upset because the order was upset? Or you didn't follow the proper order? We do that in our meetings sometimes. You know, we get ahead of ourselves. You're supposed to bring up emotion and then have what? Discussion and then have what? A vote. Does that always work in our meetings? That I guess we should just throw the papers in the air and get mad and storm out. Would that work? You get back on track. Galatians 5.22, it says, what is the fruit that we need to have? The fruit that Jesus is looking for is the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the peace, the long-suffering, the patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such thing there is no law. And Matthew 3.8, bring forth therefore fruits that meet for repentance. We come in to the church to meet that requirement of repentance so that we can repent and that we can get filled and that we cannot let the enemy destroy our, our walk. I've been struggling not to go to Texas earlier and it seems like January, um, January, oh Lord, seems like November 20th is like forever, every day. You know, normally I wake up on January and I go to bed and I wake up, it's already May. Have you ever know how fast things go? But since we had planned on going to see my son, it's like every day is a drag. It's like, oh man, is this only Monday? Is this only Tuesday? I mean, it seems like it's just dragging. Because there's an anticipation. And we need to be, understand that we need to have that patience to understand that the devil is going to come and he's going to try to destroy your peace. And he's going to try to destroy everything that he, God has done in your life. And so my whole thing was last, last week was how do I impart that to a church? We could talk about it. We could pray about it. And I've been told, well, you should have told people. That don't work, guys. The devil's not going to warn you. The devil's going to find you in a weak spot and he's going to attack you. I remember when we were in San Miguel in El Salvador. We sent out our intelligence and the great CIA told us that there was no enemy in the area and that we don't have to worry about it because they have withdrawn all the way into Mexico. What did we do? We went to sleep. At 3 o'clock in the morning, we got overran. 
186 soldiers were killed on our side because we went to sleep. Well, that's not fair. Those guys should have called us and told us that they were thinking about attacking us. The enemy is not going to tell you what he's going to do. But if we were prepared and we had information that people told us that the enemy was going to attack us within two or three days. But then we had another administration that came to us and says, no, man, they're gone. Don't worry about it. We trusted the wrong intelligence. You know, he, he says the same story in Matthew 21. And when he came to that tree in Matthew, he, he looked, he said, let, no, let nothing grow from this tree again. Do you want to be a church when Christ comes and says there's no fruit and let it never have any fruit? Or do you want to be the church that's in season and out of season doing what God has called you to do regardless of what the enemy does? Leaves with no fruit simply means, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. What is the form of godliness? It is all, all attention of ordinances and religions and organizations. It's also lies, visible and active lies, activity, people showing that who they are, the gloating of who, what they do but not identifying with the tree. Now, Tina the other day, you know, we're driving, driving up from uh, Kokomo, and she goes, look at that tree, it's persimmon, pull over. And I pull over, she gets out, and she looks at the tree, and she goes, oh, oh. I go, what was that? It's an apple tree. But what did she think? The leaves is what brought her in until she recognized the fruit, what was on it. And this is what happens with us in, Mark, in Matthew 7, 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? So what is he hungry for? Jesus could produce food. He was hungry for the souls. He was hungry for the fruit that brings repentance. He was hungry for those, a church that's hungry to reach out for the lost, that are not so wrapped around their organization, but they're hungry to hear what God has for them. They put on the full armor of God. I even wore an emblem on my, on my suit that said, the armor of God. I gave all kinds of clues. I even told the staff that I was going to disrupt the service. I just didn't tell them how. Because I didn't know how. I just knew I was going to do it. And I was waiting for the time. The devil knows he's going to disrupt this church. He may not know the timing, but he's waiting for the opportunity. In Psalms 1-3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit, in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whosoever he doth shall prosper. Are we a church planted by the river that we are so strong that no matter what the devil does, it's not going to shake us? Are we so anchored on the promises of Jesus Christ? Is our church built on the solid rock? Or are we on the shifting sands of doctrines? Psalms 92 the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still forth bring fruit at old. I love this one. Now, don't get mad. This is Psalms 92, 12. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. That's what it says. And this one's for my wife. And they shall be fat and flourishing. I'm following the word of God. (laughs) 
The bad things about leaves, too, is that sometimes you can hide behind them. Sometimes people go to church to hide behind it. The first sin, when Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? What did they cover themselves with? Fig leaves. What were they covering? Their shame. The leaves also is used for covering. I know in big churches, I know people that go to those churches to hide because they can come and go and no one ever noticed they were even there or never was there. They come and they go. They don't even know them. I remember I was at Manor for nine years and we had four services. I decided to help on the last service. And I was going to help in the foyer and, and, and greet the people coming in and talk to them. And I had this family come in and I sat down and go, man, I'm so glad to see you. And, you know, my name is Jim. He goes, yeah, I know who you are. I said, really? I've, I've never. He said, yeah, we've been coming here for four years. But yet they're coming to the last service, which I never attended. And I said, why don't you get part of the church? He goes, we like it because no one knows us. They're hiding. Going to the temple to hide, Jeremiah 7, 4. Trusting not in lying words, saying that the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, all of these things, praising God, but yet inside of you, you are not bearing any fruit. Jeremiah 7, 9. He says, it's on page 1175, your pew Bible, if you'd like to look at it. Will you steal... Murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to bow. In other words, the culture. And walk after other gods whom you do not know. And then come and stand before me in the house which is called by my name. And say, we are delivered to do these things, abominations. Has the house of which is called by my name become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I have seen it, says the Lord. You can't hide in here. You can't pretend to be a Christian. It's going to get revealed. God is going to bring some weirdo and he's going to mess up your life and he's going to, sh he's going to show your true colors. We had a guy, we had a group, a family in our church in Hagerstown that was a Mooney. And I told the elders, I said, I think they're Moonies based upon their teachings. And the elder says, you can't accuse no one like that. You've got to be very careful because we may lose that family. And I said, you know who the Moonies are? They infiltrate churches and they come in, they pretend to be part of the church, and then they start sowing in their, their discord and sowing in their stuff. And next thing you know is that they've destroyed the church. And I said, well, I'm going to call them out. The elder said, nope, you can't do that. Not unless you have ironclad proof. So on one Sunday morning... I called the, the, the gentleman up, and I says, uh, it's been brought to my attention that you are a Mooney in front of the whole congregation. And he looked at me and says, no, I'm not. I says, fine. Then right here, stand, and I want you to repeat these words. Reverend Mooney is a false prophet. He's a false god, and he is a, the devil. And he looked at me and says, I cannot say that. And I looked at him, why not? He says, because he's my God. He got called out. But yet, he was being hiding by protection from the elders. Let me tell you, said, something else that happened with that one elder that protected him. They convinced him to invest their company, a multi-million dollar company, into some stocks or some stuff that went south. That was a, it was a scam. It was all part of the Mooney stuff. They got all the money and got nothing in return, and he lost his construction company. Looking at the leaves and not the fruit. Although it was not the season, the figs were not yet, but he still required the fruit. No specific season for spiritual fruits. 
we need to be producing fruit year round. The problem is, is the root. Where are you anchored to? In John 15, 4 and 5, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye expect to abide in me. I am the vine. Ye, I love, I mean, I, I, I've got this on purpose, because ye means plural, or the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, singular, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me, ye, we all here, can do nothing. How can this happen? How can this? Because we got to get our nourishment, not from a bulletin board or a bulletin, but from the word of God. I had an elder once tell me, says, I understand your sermons. And I said, yeah. Said, and I understand that you feel that you're moved by the Holy Spirit to preach certain things. I said, yeah. He says, I don't care about the Holy Spirit. You've got 30 minutes for sermon and that's it. You want to know where that happened at? Right here. In this church. John 5.10, if ye, all of us, keep my commandments, the commandments of God, ye, all of us, shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus kept his commandments. Jesus was not going to be drawn out. The devil came to Jesus when he was weak, when he had fasted for 40 days. But Jesus could not be bought. So to start off with, you should be born again. How can I be born again? Nicodemus asked that question. In 1 Peter 1.23, being born again, not a corruptible seed. We're not talking about being born of a corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible seed by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God. It says here, the, but incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How do we be, how are we born again? Through the word of God. Not through ordinances, not through bylaws. Many churches have bylaws on how are you born again. It's very simple. How do I born again? I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I turn my life over to Him, and I make Him Lord of my life, and I get baptized unto death, and I rise again. I'm a new creature. I'm a new person. True fruits. What is that? What does it mean by having true fruits? What are we given? Do we, do we get, does God give us rotten apples? What happens with a rotten apple and you put it in a batch of good apples? It destroys the whole batch. So we're born again of an incorruptible seed. We don't have any bad seed in us if we're following Jesus Christ. And when something happens and goes wrong, I got friends of mine that thinks because of the election. I told them, I said, don't put your faith in the election. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, next Sunday we have an election. And we're ready for it. We... Normally, we give the count right after the service, and we let you know that these elders and these, uh, these people in the executive committee have been elected. But, this, but next Sunday, we're going to wait a week before we announce it, because if we don't get the results we want, we just run off some more ballots. Why not?
You know, I was in Hagerstown when Maryland came out and says, we're so proud. And I says, why are you guys so proud? She was a, she, or her, her husband was an, a deacon in the church. I go, why are you so proud? Maryland had 125% turnout of all registered voters. We really got people motivated. And I looked at her and says, you know what that means, right? She goes, what's that? I says, well, that means as a minimum, 25% of those votes is fraudulent. Well, you can't prove that. Because you see, they're following and hearing what the world is saying and not what the Word of God says. The truth is, on our election, any time after that election, next week, you can come into the office and you can look at the ballots and you can count them. Why? Because we're not hiding nothing. Now, if you're coming in to cause a disrupt and just to cause a problem, then we'll have an elders meeting. There is a difference between wanting information and just wanting to cause trouble. You've got to look at the fruit. Many people mistake true conversion and true conviction with an emotional breakdown or, or an extreme excitement. And in North Carolina, we used to call people like that the goosebump chasers. You know what a goosebump chaser is? Go to church to church to find the next, next thing to make them feel good. We need to deal with the fruits that we are given. We need to be with the fruits of joy. No matter what happens in this service. No matter what happens in America. And I'm and not preaching to myself. Don't happen to me in my family. I cannot let the devil take this joy and this peace away from me. John 15, 16. Ye, all of us, have not chosen me. All, Jesus is saying, all of us. Here, first Christian. You did not choose Jesus. But I have chosen you and ordained you that ye, all of us, should go and bring forth what? Fruit. And that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you do, ye do, shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And right after this sermon, he goes right into a prayer. He says, I've seen the fig tree, there's no fruit. Then he turns around and says, anything you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. He's putting the two together. You know, I've been praying since I've been here for a 1972 Corvette. Man, God is just slow. Don't he know that for the last three years? Why hadn't he given me a 72 Corvette? It's not in his will, exactly. Now, if I ask to be on fire for God, if I ask that I would... Not just for numbers, because many times we want to put numbers in our chairs because we want to brag about our numbers. But if we truly want to seek the lost, he will put people in front of us. You know, I love Peter. Peter's like a guy like I was, always putting his foot in his mouth. You know, have you ever had people like that? Look what Peter said in Mark 11, verse 20. It's on page 1563. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the root. And Peter remembered, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. You think Jesus didn't recognize that? Well, then what did Jesus immediately go to? He said, Jesus answered them and says, have faith in God. For surely as I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does no doubt in his heart, but believes that these things shall be, be done, and he will have whatever he asks. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask with you in pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. He put the two together. It's not for things. It's not for money. Now, if you're wanting to do something, 
I know a guy in North Carolina that wrote a $1.2 million check to our church. And I asked him, I said, what was this about? He says, when I started my business, I asked God. I said, Lord, make my business that one day I can write a million dollar check to a church, not out of desperation, but out of my abundance. And he says, I'm fulfilling this check now. And I said, so you're just writing a $1.2 million check? He goes, like you write a $100 check, son. He, was for, see, he asked God, and he was fulfilling the promise. Did God demand that $1.2 million from him? No. He offered it to God. And he says, if you bless me, out of my abundance, I want to do this. And God did that. It took him 35 years. Peter goes, look. And Jesus says, guys, just pray. Pray for what I need you to do. In Mark eleven twenty, 20, he reminded him. He brought the subject. He brought it up. And Jesus responded, pray. Now, when Christ comes, when Christ returns a second time, what is he going to find here on earth? What is he going to look for? Is he going to find anything? Is he going to find any fruits? If you find no fruits, it's because you never asked for them in faith. This is never a blank check to ask for whatever you want or assume that you're just going to do it and think God is a teller machine that you just go put in your punch in your magical number and get whatever you want. He's going to give to you what you have earned and what he knows that you can handle. And it says very clearly, we will produce fruit. But many times we ask for things for the wrong motives. I think pastors, I've done it, ask for things. Lord, help me grow this church. Lord, help me do these things. And, you know, I look at other pastors. Oh, man, their church is growing. And we do it here in the church. We talk about, well, is this church growing? Is that church growing? Is this church doing this? So do we want to grow just because we want to be better than somebody else? Do we want to grow because we want to be bigger than this abundant life church? Or do we want to do what God has called us to do? Well, the numbers is what means things, really. How many followers did Jesus have when he went to the, temp when he went to the cross? He started off with how many? Twelve. He fed 5,000. He fed 4,000. He had all kinds of people coming. I mean, think about all the things that happened. And he was alone. And then when he rose from the grave, how many followers did he have then? At the most, 500. Well, that's a pretty good number, church. And then he, they watched Jesus go to heaven. And they see the cloud coming. They see, physically see him going into the heavens. And they're waiting. And an angel comes, what are you doing? I'm in the Galilee. We're waiting for him to come back. He says he's going to come back just as he left. So how's he coming back? In the cloud. But go to Jerusalem and wait for the Comforter. Jesus died 40 days later. He ascended into heaven. Ten days later, how many people were in the upper room? 120. Are we part of the 120? Or are we part of the 380 that did not wait for the Holy Spirit? Who are we? In Luke 18, verse 6. Then the Lord said, Hear the unique judge said, And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night for him, though he bears long for them? 
I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Or are you guys going to run away because the music's out of tune? Or the music hit the wrong tune? Or Cindy hit the wrong note? Or the pastor disrupt your service? What's going to happen when Christ is getting ready to come? The devil knows his time is short. And the best thing to do is to put the church asleep. Many years I prayed every year for the, for the, for the prior of, of, the, of the martyrs. And every year everybody goes, oh, I'm so sorry for the martyrs. And I heard on, on TV the other day, I was, I was thinking about this stuff, and I'm going... I heard a guy says, well, I don't understand these veterans. They come back from Iraq and everything is given to them. Why do they got a problem? And I says, have you ever been there? Have you ever been there day and night not knowing if you're going to live or die? you ever been in a barrage of artillery shell where your ears are bleeding? Or when you sit there and you pick up a buddy of yours? that you went to basic training with, his, his whole bottom of his legs are blown out. And then you come home and people that sit back here, what are they, quarterback? What do they say? Monday morning quarterback? and says, what's your problem? See, they've been in that warfare. And the devil knows all I got to do is keep you guys out of the warfare. You guys have no idea when the battle is going to come. And you're going to have no idea how to react to it. I remember sitting there with a friend of mine in El Salvador, and he was an atheist. And he was making fun of me. Until we got attacked, and they were throwing this, it's called the rampa, it's a catapult that the guerrillas were using, and they throw a bunch of dynamite into the camp. Not very accurate, but scares you to death. And we go, jump out of our bunks, and we hit the, our, our fighting position, and I'm sitting there, and he's down there. I said, what are you doing? God's got to deliver us. I said, there is no God. And he looked at me, he went, what? I said, there is no God. Remember? He accepted Christ that moment. But yet when he was back in the States, guess what? There was no God. Many Christians do the same thing. Many Christians come to church. And I wonder of myself, if Jesus Christ came through that door right now, would I even recognize him? Or would I be like the Pharisees? Don't you dare step on this prophet. Hey, you're not ordained. You're not called by the elders. Get down there. Sit down. Isn't that what the Pharisees did when Jesus showed up? Now, I always talk. I, heard, I got this from a pastor one time. And he says, I'd love to be able to get up there and start preaching. And the Holy Spirit come and this pulpit just go up in the air and split and go, go to pieces. How many would still be in this room? You know, I've told people many times, it says, do you believe in the gifts? I said, yeah. He says, do you believe that you could raise the dead? I said, probably, but the problem is there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be somebody else taking this place. And they go, what are you talking about? Can you imagine going into a funeral home to do a funeral and the Holy Spirit tell you, raise him? And you go, yeah, right, okay. Hey, John, rise, and he gets up, I have a heart attack, I'm down. <laughs> There'll be another funeral right then. Why? Because, see, I'm not really believing. Because if I truly believed that God, the Holy Spirit had told me to do it, and I truly believed that he was going to rise, I should not be surprised. We are, though. But we're all in the same situation. So, when Christ comes, 
Will he be, will he find faith in this church? Or are we just, what did, what did Jesus call the Pharisees? Whitewashed tombs, stones, dead on the inside? I know people got upset last Sunday. But let me explain something to you. Now you're probably going to get madder yet. I did it on purpose. Why? I wanted you to understand what spiritual warfare is. Not just hear it, but feel it. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we are your church. Lord, if you come in season and out of season, let us be bearing the fruit that you have given to us and that you have called us to do. Lord, if it's Africa, South America, if it's across the street, Lord, if it's at the firehouse feeding people, let us show the fruit of Jesus Christ and let us be with expectation, Lord. That when you come, we will recognize you and we will know who you are. And Lord, I do pray that when the devil attacks, that the leadership of this church, the members of this church, Lord, those that have been washed by the precious blood will truly recognize who the devil is. And Lord, and call him by name. And Lord, and call upon the Holy Spirit. We will not fail. We will not fall. This church will stand on the solid rock. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.